So hi, uh, my name's Dan Clark. I work on the Smart Cambridge program. Uh, the Smart Cambridge program uh, sits within Cambridgeshire County Council. Although uh, Cambridgeshire itself is blessed with many layers of governance, so um, we are also working with the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Combined Authority, uh, which has a mayor um, and sits across Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. Um, we're primarily funded by the Greater Cambridge Partnership, which is a partnership between the City Council, the District Council that surrounds Cambridge, Cambridge County Council and the University are also a partner within that. And we work very closely with the city and the district. So we span all the different layers of government um, that cover both Cambridge City and the kind of rural area and market towns that surround it. Um, so I'm going to talk today about our kind of work looking at how technology um, and data can begin to help Cambridge and the surrounding area to address some of the very significant challenges that it has. Um, so Cities are really complex places, uh, lots of different systems, and although they're different in character, both within the UK and across the world, they do face some of the same challenges. Um, I think it's worth noting, uh, uh, to, or to say at this point, that the, the kind of the challenges that I'm going to talk through um, are ones that we've articulated over a number of years, and this is kind of pre-COVID. So um, cities are facing an even greater and more complex challenge at the moment. Um, and what we're trying to do is trying to predict actually what this current situation, the impact it's going to have on us as a city, how it will potentially change land use, um, how it's going to change the way that people use city centres, high streets, and the way that people are going to move around as well. So um, we're seeing less people using public transport, but more people cycling and walking. Um, and we're trying to predict what the trends are going to be both in the short, medium and long term so that we can begin to respond to them. Um, what we did know before this happened was that Cambridge was growing very rapidly, like many cities. Um, there was an estimated additional 44,000 jobs that were going to be created in Cambridge. Um, we already had a housing market um, that had a shortage of supply and the average house price was 13 times the average wage, which made it unaffordable for many people. So they couldn't live in the city. So we needed to build more houses and there were plans to build 35 and a half thousand new houses in uh, new towns and villages, places like North So and Camborne, Waterbeach and Bourne. The city already has huge pressure on its public transport system and its infrastructure. And if we carry on the way that we are and we don't invest in new infrastructure and think about different ways of moving people around, then things are just going to get worse. And there's a possibility that people could spend more and more time stuck in traffic. So in South Cams, which is the area that surrounds Cambridge, if we did nothing, the amount of time people spent in congestion would double by 2030. So we've got plans to get one in four people out of their cars by investing in public transport, looking at things like mass rapid transport and investing in cycling and um, pedestrian facilities. At the same time, we've got significant um, constraints on our infrastructure. We know that we need to triple the capacity of energy networks to support the amount of growth that's planned. Um, we know that we've got significant issues with air quality that we need to address. And all of this is against a backdrop of wanting to be more sustainable and moving towards zero carbon. So really thinking about how the solutions that we put in place address both the issues but also help us to move towards that zero carbon target. And so as a program, our role uh, is to look at how new emerging technology and data can begin to address some of those challenges. Um, what we've seen is, you know, cities have always embraced new technologies and innovation, whether that's uh, the electrical grids when electricity first came into cities and building on top of that new applications that help them to grow and help businesses to grow. Um, we've seen you know water infrastructure come into cities in the past which has helped them to grow and develop and this is exactly the same it's digital infrastructure coming into cities and helping cities to develop. Um, 
So whether that's mobile and fiber connectivity, whether that's data infrastructure, it's helping to unlock new applications which are helping cities to address some of these challenges. We're seeing the private sector, for good or bad, delivering some of those solutions. So people like Uber and Airbnb coming into cities and, you know, cities having actually very little control over the way those technologies are deployed. And yes, there are some, you know, positive aspects to that, but we are seeing some significant downsides. So we as the public sector are beginning to look at, or have been looking at for a while, how we can begin to harness technology and data to really begin to uh, help develop the city, to make the city a better place to live in. When I first started, there was this kind of whole concept around smart cities, the idea that you could build a platform or that the city would become a platform, you would have a city brain and by bringing data into one place, we could solve all the problems of a city. But actually, what we know is that cities, you know, it's not about efficiency. It's not really about um, being able to bring data together. It's about creating a better place for our residents and people and really understanding what the problems are and then bringing technology as a tool together with other things, which are, um, you know, how do we uh, upskill our staff so that we can deliver technology into cities? Um, thinking about governance, so um, you know how we make our decisions, how residents can interact with the city, um, and the complex interplay between the public sector, the private sector, um, and really you know how technology can enable that conversation between the uh, citizens and the decision makers. So. Uh, Smart Cambridge was set up about five years ago to investigate, trial and develop uh, emerging technologies and data solutions. Um, we've worked very closely with a lot of the operation teams and with our residents to really begin to understand what the challenges are and articulate them, and then to look out at the market to begin to understand how technology and data can help us to address those. We're a very small team, there's three of us at the moment. Um, and we, because of that, we rely very heavily on collaboration and that's been really important to us as a programme. Uh, most importantly for us has been collaboration with local residents and we've uh, been out and worked with them. We were looking at wayfinding within the city. We ran a wayfinding hack and we worked very closely with residents to really understand you know, what some of the issues were about moving around the city and getting information on things like buses. We uh, worked in a market town for about six months trying to really understand some of the issues they were facing and how some of the work that we had been doing in Cambridge could transfer over to the market town and actually how we could begin to develop new solutions to really help them uh, as a community and as a place to develop. Our other really important collaboration is with uh, the kind of acad academic sector in Cambridge. We built some really close relationships with both the University of Cambridge and Anglia Ruskin University. Um, that we've just finished some work with uh, Tamea um, on uh, digital twins. So looking at how the concept of digital twins may be able to help uh, the city to better plan and model and how we can bring different uh, city systems together. Um, we've actually set up a joint venture with the university to deploy uh, fibre across the city um, and also to begin to sell uh, fibre infrastructure, dark fibre, out to the market. Um, and we work very closely with the computer lab, so that's been a really important uh, collaboration for us. As a local authority, we don't necessarily have the skills that we need um, to be able to take advantage of new technology. And being able to work with people who really are at the cutting edge of uh, data and technology has helped us to build our capabilities and our capacity. And also where we've been sensing things like uh, air quality, we work very closely with the chemistry department. Um, and we work with business. So we've got quite a, a wide uh, collaboration with local businesses. We work at Cambridge Wireless, who are a local business networking organization. Um, and for us, working with business means that we've helped them to, do, to develop solutions with some, to some of our uh, problems. They get to actually work with cities to really understand what the issues are, how they can build solutions that actually help 
Um, that helps their kind of market offering. It really helps us to understand the art of the possible. So we've worked and helped a number of uh, Cambridge companies to develop products and then we've de uh, deployed them within the city. We also do a lot of pilots and trials. So we encourage businesses to come in and pilot and trial technology. We then assess that so that we understand how things work um, and they get to you know, trial in a real world environment, uh, new products that they're developing. And governance was really important. So I think we've seen a number of big smart city projects fall down on government, uh, governance. Most recently, uh, Waterfront in Toronto, the Sidewalk Labs project. And it's really important for us that as the public sector, we're driving the technology agenda and it's not being driven by big companies and that we're getting what we want out of it. Um, I think it's very easy to fall into the trap of thinking one provider can come in and deliver a kind of a whole smart city suite. Um, but, you know, we, what we've seen is actually it needs to be an ecosystem of companies with a, with a very strong governance uh, layer over the top of it so that our elected members have a very strong say in what's happening, particularly when we start looking at collecting data and the ethical use of data. And we need to get the foundations right. So we've been spending a lot of time uh, and uh, government money uh, investing in broadband, super fast broadband, looking at things like public access Wi-Fi so that people can access uh, the internet while they're in the city, um, and looking at the next generation of connectivity. So things like 5G. And a kind of starting point, so it was quite difficult. How do you get into this kind of smart city world, this, uh, this kind of concept? was to begin to map out actually what we already had. And we knew that we had a lot of data and a lot of connected infrastructure, but actually it wasn't being used. So we did a data audit to really understand what we had, um, to understand what infrastructure we had. And off the back of that, we realized that data was sat in lots of different silos. It was unusable. Um, there were lots of different licensing conditions. We actually didn't own some of the data that we had. Um, and so we wanted to be, begin to bring it into one place that we, so that we could really begin to use it. And with the computer labs at the university, we identified a real gap in being able to handle and use real time uh, data from around the city. So one of the first things that we did was we built a real time data platform. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, so the purpose of this was to take some of the real-time data that we had from around the city so that we could begin to use it and experiment with it. So this isn't a kind of a commercial platform. It's very much a research platform. The idea is that we collect real-time data from around the city. We begin to store it. We analyze it. Uh, we can use it in real time. Um, and using that historic data, we can begin to predict when things might happen and then we can begin to adapt our infrastructure. So we might predict that traffic is building up in a certain area and actually it's going to become more congested. So we need to adapt our traffic signals or we need to uh, output better information to travellers to say actually this part of the city is congested. As part of that, we also built a, um, an open sensor network based on a technology called LoRa. So anyone could come and deploy sensors in the city. And we also uh, created an API so that anybody could come and pick up and use real time data. And we work quite hard thinking about how you use that data. So it's really important for us to show value. And we knew that one of the areas that um, people wanted us to output data into was travel information. So we built three uh, travel tools. We built something called Motion Map, which was a multimodal, multi-operator travel app, which we didn't have in the city, which utilized real-time bus data. Um, we built some lobby screens that sit in buildings that give real-time bus, real-time train uh, information and some other contextual information. And we put a totem outside the station. And all of that is about giving people real-time information and to encourage them to use public transport. We encourage people to feed back on those products so that we can continue to iterate them and improve them. So again, that's really important. I think that feedback loop between the user and us developing digital tools. So we, and we kind of started off in, in transport. We looked at different processes. So we worked with a company called Appy Parking to digitize um, something called TROs, traffic re uh, restriction orders. Um, so that's all about digitizing a 
process within the county council uh, that's made the people who work on in that team it's made their life easier and also we begin to look at how we can make that open so one of the other principles of the data platform that we built was where we can we open up data and make it as easy as possible for people to come and use and we're continuing to do that so we know we've got a long way to go there are lots of data sets that we want to open up but we will continue to do that so this is about kind of digitization of a process. I think what's important to say is that we're not just digitizing, taking something that was paper-based and digitizing it. We try to design it from the very beginning to make it as uh, operator-friendly as possible. Um, and looking at how we output data. So uh, for people who aren't data scientists and we, you know, we don't have really access to a data science team, we've got a business intelligence unit who can use data, but they're very busy and we want to make it as easy as possible for everyone to be able to access and use data. So we work with a company called Geospot to build a tool, which means that we can put city data into it and begin to visualize it. So even people who aren't data experts can really begin to draw out intelligence, um, and begin to understand uh, how they can use data in their day-to-day -day work, whether that's creating policy or informing their decisions. And this has been particularly useful when we've been talking to our elected members, um, because we can demonstrate that actually we do have quite a good understanding of the way that traffic moves around the city, and it gives them much more confidence in our, in our decision-making processes and helps inform their decision-making processes as well. Um, and this has kind of all come together. We did quite a big uh, project on Mill Road last year. So Mill Road uh, Bridge was closed. Uh, only cyclists and pedestrians could get over it. And we saw this as an opportunity to pull together everything that we've been doing. So we've been looking at sensor deployments for movement. We've been looking at how we could, you know, share and use data. Um, and also looking at how we could combine data sets. So in this project, we measured cycle movements, pedestrian movements and traffic movements and air quality before, during and after Mill Road closure. And the idea was that we would be able to understand the impact of that. And then by understanding the impact of a road closure within the city, we could begin to build future policies around it. And it was a great success. So we, we got um, some really interesting, very granular data. And you know, there, are, there are conversations going on about how we reallocate road space within the city. And the learnings from that will inform those conversations. And we've done a lot of experiments. So a lot of them have failed. Some of them have been very successful, but I thought it would be worth talking just through three, which will give you an idea of some of the kind of, you know, some of the challenges that we've come across. So um, uh, one of the teams within the County Council invested in a Bluetooth uh, network. And the idea was that we would be able to measure traffic movements through Bluetooth signatures. Um, the company that sold the system uh, told us that we would be able to understand cycling movements. Um, but once we really began to delve down into the, the way that they were calculating that, all they were doing was taking off the bottom 10% of Bluetooth signatures and saying, well, these must be cyclists. But of course, in Cambridge, um, it could be the top 40% because cyclists are moving faster than drivers. So it was giving false readings. So we've had to do a lot of work to turn that raw data into intelligence. The other one was we did some uh, work with bin sensors to be able to understand how full bins were. And this was to generate savings for um, the waste service within Cambridge. And what we found was that we have bin bags in our rubbish uh, bins and they flap and they were giving false readings. So the people were having to keep going back to the bins and they weren't full. And the solution that the uh, sensor provider told us to do was to put Vaseline down the inside of the bins and to stick bin bags to, the, to it. And of course, that drove out any savings we may have made and effectively rendered the technology useless. So I think trialing is really important because it does, it does show you all these weaknesses in the kind of system. And then we did a big air quality data exercise. And what that demonstrated was actually we need to bring data sets together. So we were getting spikes in uh, air quality data. Um, it was a, a NO2. And if we'd have had detailed contextual data about movement on the road network that we could bring together with that air quality data, then perhaps we could have identified what vehicles were causing it. So what have we learned? Well, 
you know, we need to really understand what problem it is that we're solving. We need to be user driven, but we do need to consider the system and the system of systems. So, as I said at the beginning, cities are really complex. They're, they're a, a system of systems and you cannot look at things in isolation. You have to understand the impact of what you're doing is going to have on other systems. I think really technology is very rarely the answer. It may be part of the answer, but uh, you know, if we look at things like congestion, of course, cycling is part of the answer. Um, you know, hard signs may be part of the answer. We can't get bogged down in thinking that technology can solve these problems. And it's difficult to overcome organizational silos and city silos. So that idea at the beginning of the smart city, which brings all those silos together, actually it's much more complicated like, than that. And a lot of the issues are organizational and they're about people. And so you really need to address those issues as well as some of the technological issues that would help to unlock um, some of the benefits of working across silos. And technology shouldn't be a separate silo. So, you know, we are a technology program and we've tried really hard to embed ourselves in and across the organization, um, particularly thinking about not having a smart city strategy, but embedding smart city principles in other strategies so that it sits across everything. Um, business cases are really difficult for a lot of new technology, and that really needs a lot of work and a lot of thinking about. And also, this is a completely different skill set. So we need to think how as an organization we change and the importance of ethics and governance. We really need to think very carefully about technology, the technology we're putting into the city, how we're collecting data and the governance processes that sit above that. So for us, our next step really is to move up from this trialing environment and to begin to deploy at scale and creating a business as usual data infrastructure that can give residents access to all the data they want as open data and that we have the data that we need. Um, and we need to engage residents in that conversation. And we've already started that through the digital twin work that we did with Tamea. And Tamea has been out and been talking to communities about what they would like to see. Um, trust infrastructure. So we want to build out our trust infrastructure um, that will sit across our data work and really scale the solutions that we've been working on and embedding those smart principles within policy and strategy and really begin to bring those city systems together. And that was the idea of the first stage of our digital twin work was really to begin to bring city systems together. Transport was a good starting place. That forms the core of a lot of things. So um, air quality is connected to um, transport, the energy grid, things like health and social care actually rely on transport. So it was a good way in and we're beginning to expand the uh, breadth of activity that we're doing. And so we'll work from there and begin to expand the program. And we're also looking at how we can begin to take this out into rural areas. And that's it from me. Thank you.